In this lesson, I would like to talk to you about scale, and this is an extremely important and very fundamental concept in geography. Scale in geography can actually have at least two different, yet very interrelated, meanings within the discipline. Cartographers and geographic information system specialists are, of course, often very concerned with scale. When a cartographer talks about scale, he or she is talking about the size relationship between the features depicted on the globe or map and their actual size on the planet. If you're working in these fields, then scale is something that must always be considered. Maps are always designed to a certain scale, and even digital data sets for geographic information systems are collected at a particular scale and are only appropriate for use at certain scales as well. Geographic features are, in general, very large, and yet are desks, sheets of paper, computer monitors, and even projection screens are comparatively small. Therefore, when cartographers and geographic information system specialists and geographers in general work with this kind of information, they are always working with representations of these features that are smaller than the features themselves. This is a very important consideration that is always present when working with maps and similar digital data. There are at least three major ways that this size relationship can be communicated. You might simply tell someone that one inch on a particular map represents one mile on the Earth, or that one inch on the map would represent 2,000 feet on the Earth. This is called a verbal or a statement scale. Another way of communicating scale information is to use a graphic or a bar scale. Oftentimes, when you talk about a map scale to someone in the general population, they automatically think of a scale bar, that alternating black and white line on a map that tells you how far a certain distance is supposed to represent in the world. Frequently, however, cartographers and other geographic information specialists will communicate scale relationships in a third way, the use of what we call a representative fraction, such as the expression 1 to 24,000. If you are working with a map at a scale of 1 to 24,000, then it means that any one of any unit on the map will represent 24,000 of the same unit in the actual world. Because scale is a ratio, specialists in this area often prefer for the scale to be communicated as a representative fraction because it is a unitless communication of the scale information. If you're working on a map that is a scale of 1 to 24,000, then one of any unit on that map the user chooses to use would represent 24,000 of the same unit on the map. It would be true that one inch represents 24,000 inches. It would also be the case that one centimeter on the map would represent 24,000 centimeters in the real world. So that's one way that we can use the term scale in geography. But we can also talk about the analytical scale of a particular project. Often, this has to do with the level of spatial aggregation involved in the project. For instance, if we were going to be studying unemployment in the United States, there are a variety of scales at which you could study this. You could study unemployment at the level of the entire United States, and perhaps have a single number for the unemployment of the United States every month. And in fact, this kind of number is exactly the one that's reported very frequently in different news outlets. In this case, you are aggregating across the entire United States to derive a single unemployment number. That's conducting an analysis of the unemployment at a certain scale, but it is certainly not the only level at which you could analyze that information. In geography, we're always aware of the fact that aggregation of this kind of information at a particular level can often disguise very significant variations in phenomenon that you're studying. So perhaps you might intuitively think that probably some states in the United States have unemployment levels higher or lower than the figure for the entire United States at any given month. You might also be interested in knowing what states have higher percentages and which have the lower percentages. Perhaps there is some interesting geographic pattern that should be recognized in unemployment across the United States. So you could certainly calculate unemployment figures on a state-by-state -state basis. This would be conducting the unemployment analysis at a different scale. Likewise, it doesn't take too much to imagine that you could also conduct similar analysis at the county level. There is probably trends that you can determine 
at a county level that are completely disguised when you aggregate across the entire United States. Perhaps that's a better way to study unemployment. But it may very well be the case that there is no one correct scale at which to study any particular geographic phenomenon. The scale at which you study the phenomenon will depend on your purpose, what you want to know, and also what data is available. By the way, we should also note that we could talk in terms of spatiotemporal aggregation and not just spatial aggregation. If I were to give you only a single number for the unemployment figure across the entire United States, and I gave you only one number for each year, you would get a very different picture of the unemployment in the United States than if I were to give you the numbers for unemployment percentages in each county, and I gave them to you every month. So we have both a geographic scale, spatial scale there, but we also have differences in temporal scales there. So we talk about spatiotemporal aggregation and can potentially search for trends within both. This actually brings up a related point that we will get into in a different lesson in more detail, but it's called the modifiable aerial unit problem, and it is a concern always in geography. However, in brief, the modifiable aerial unit problem addresses this concern. Even if you were going to be studying, say, unemployment, for example, at the scale of the counties in the United States, you might realize that the county boundaries are, in certain senses, rather arbitrary. They're rather arbitrary geographic units at which to study unemployment. They might indeed be one of the only spatial scales which actually reports this kind of data. So you have to be aware of what data is available. But they're still rather arbitrary. Sometimes the distribution of some phenomenon can be concealed simply because of the way that you're aggregating the data. So for example, if you are trying to study the distribution of cancer and trying to figure out whether or not uh, it related to the presence of some industrial facility, but as it happened, the industrial facility that you were trying to study was very close to the border of two U.S. states. So it draws workers from both states to it and then it may be if it's uh, producing some type of toxin or something that it would influence the citizens of one state and the other state. But if the cancer statistics are kept only at the state level, if you're aggregating by the state level, then that may conceal the presence of what you might call a local hotspot surrounding that industrial facility that would show up if there were other geographic units or other divisions of the geographic area that had been chosen for the analysis. So it is also the case that the way you choose to divide space when you're conducting an analysis may influence the results that you get. So scale is an essential and ever-present part of geographic studies and something that we need to be thinking about, at least in the back of our minds, all the time.